Hey, our babies, we're back at Tidewater with Bill here to explain to us about how to wire all of this up. You know, in the first video, we talked about the size batteries and how many batteries you might need and some of the pros and cons of that. That's all fine and good. But how do you hook this stuff up and what, how do you determine what size wires you need for everything? Again, it's all a mystery to me. So let's, let's and, oh, and then a little bit later, we're gonna go in the shop and actually wire a few things up. That'll be kind of fun. All righty. Uh, so we're talking about picking the proper gauge for batteries. It's all about load um, and or how many amps are being pulled through that wire, mm -hmm. as well as what the intended purpose of the end device is. Um, so there's two, two, ch uh, two charts that we're really concerned with, and once again, it all comes back to ABYC. Uh, right. American Boat and Yacht Council has put together a lot of information for us that says what's the, how, much, how many amps can a wire safely handle. Uh, another thing we're concerned about is, is um, the voltage drop. So especially with lower voltages like 12 volts or 24 volt systems, um, the more amps you try to push through a small wire, even though that wire can safely handle that amp, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the amperage without you know catching fire or overheating, you're not going to get 24 or 12 volts at the end of the wire. The, it's going to inherently drop throughout the oh. wire. Uh, so th does length of the run make a difference? Absolutely. Too? Yes. The the longer the run, the more that voltage is going to drop throughout that run. Now, if you use a bigger cable, that'll fix it. That'll fix it. Yeah. So so there's, okay. so, so there's two charts there. One is how many amps can we safely put through through that wire and that's how we use that to determine the circuit protection so what size fuses or, or breakers to put on that wire for safety reasons mm -hmm. other chart is the voltage drop tables that will tell us how you know, what size wire to use to make sure we're getting good voltage at the other end of the wire all right and where do yep. we find those kind of um, so abyc has that but there's also some nice free resources for boaters oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, my favorite one is made by uh, is put out there by Blue Sea Systems. Uh, they they make a lot of the breakers, okay. uh, miscellaneous electrical components for boats. Um, if you go to their website or they have a nice app on your phone, mm -hmm. it's a wire size calculator. You put in the different parameters you want, and it's going to tell you exactly what what size wire you okay. should be using. All right. Um, Good to know. Yep. So we'll go ahead and use this use the ABYC book because it's right here. Um, and we're going to talk about here because we're going to with an AC or a DC system. Um, we're usually bundling wires together, so we have you know the positive and negative together in a duplex wire, uh, or we've run a couple a handful of wires together and wire tied them all together. Uh, because those we have several wires together, we need to derate that, uh, which means that because it's going to retain more heat, so we need to push less current through it uh, okay. or less amperage through it to be safe. Um, also, we need to know what temperature the insulation is, because uh, not every wire um, has the same temperature rating on its insulation. Uh, the good stuff usually has you know, higher, higher, higher ratings on there, but you don't always have the good stuff on board. Um, and also, is it run inside of an engine space or outside of an engine space? Because engine spaces are much hotter, mm -hmm. so we need to derate that wire a little bit further okay. to be safe. And, and there's charts for that? Yes, they're all, okay. yeah, all in the manual, um, as well as that Blue Seas calculator will have options for all of those things, okay. uh, whether we're in an engine room, how many wires we're, we're bundling together, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. All right. Uh, so just a quick little thing here, 16-gauge um, cable, let's say we have 16-gauge cable, it's Anchor brand, um, so I know that's 105 degree Celsius uh, insulation on that thing. We're not running it through an engine space, but we've duplexed it in, so it's, we're running you know, multiple cables together. Mm -hmm. uh, that 16-gauge cable is going to safely be able to handle 17 and a half amps. Hmm. Uh, so as long as your circuit protection is below that, you're going to have, you're going to be safe. Now, if you're pushing 17 amps through that and it's, uh, say, 20 feet run a cable, you're not going to have good voltage at the end. So that's when we need to go to the voltage drop tables. Okay. Yep. Uh, so here, this one's telling us, you know, we've got, we're more concerned about the amperage in the circuit as well as how far we are. The and, run. and we're talking round trip because it's got to come back. So if you have, oh. if you're 20 feet from the battery, that's really a 40 that's foot 40 run. Foot. Yep. Uh, so let's say we're powering something that's, um, let's put it at the max there. So we're say it's a 15 amp 
load on that 16 gauge cable. Mm -hmm. well, we can't use 16, I'll tell you that right now. Um, but if we had a 15 amp load and we were running 40 feet, uh, we actually need to use a six gauge cable uh, instead of a 16 gauge cable in order to get that you know, good voltage at the end of the run. Okay, so now I'm always confused on this too. Mm -hmm. The bigger the number, the smaller the wire? Bigger the number, yes, correct. Okay, yes. all right. So, it's, so the six is gonna be a pretty good size mm -hmm. cable compared to uh, 24 or something. The, the, the 24 would be what, maybe like a speaker wire or something? Um, usually in boats, we don't wanna see anything under 18 gauge. Okay. Period. Right. Uh, except for your twenty-four hour <laughs> guys, I have no idea. You know, yep. it's just what came to my alleged mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, your your C smaller cables on things like your communications uh, data wires between things, but mm -hmm. as far as power, uh, U.S. Coast Guard doesn't want to see anything under eighteen. Um, but it, as a little caveat there, you can't run a single wire that's just eighteen. You have to duplex it together. Uh, okay. So if you have uh, you know, the, the red and yellow cable will put the outer sheath. You, you can run an 18 gauge cable. Uh, if you're just running a single wire down there, it needs to be 16 or larger. Okay. Uh, and the reason behind that is just the physical strength of the wire. Uh, hmm. Once you get too small, it's very easy to just, just to break it by hand. Uh, so they, they, they require that to get that physical strength in the wire to make sure we don't have a failure okay. uh, out at sea. Well, let's go do the fun stuff and wire some stuff up, guys. Sounds like let's a plan. See what we can blow up. I mean, let's see what we can do. Hi, <laughs> right, ladies. We're back here with Bill. Now we're going to do the fun stuff. We're going to hook all this up. What are the components? How does it run? How do you hook it up? I mean, we were talking just a couple minutes ago about where a battery monitor would go. And I, I want to let him explain it because I still am not real sure how that all works and where you want your charger set up so that everything works together. It's all yours, bud. Alrighty. Okay. So this is a little system that we had built uh, to train some of our new technicians on the basics of a simple circuit, but it's great for this demonstration as well. Uh, I think we'd start by showing the difference between a parallel connection with your batteries and a series connection. We'll start with a series connection. Uh, what a series connection is going to do is take the voltage of the two individual batteries and add them together. Uh, so here we have two 12 volt batteries, so we're going to combine them in a series connection. That's going to give us 24 volts on this circuit, uh, but we'll keep the same amp hour rating. So if we have two 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries and we combine them in series, we now have a 100, hour, 100 amp hour, 24 volt bank. Um, to do that, you take the uh, negative of one battery terminal, connect it to the positive of another. Uh, a little bit on the actual battery connection here. Uh, you always want to make sure you have nothing between the lead of this battery post and your ring terminals. Uh, you can use a washer, but it has to be on the very top of everything. You can't have it between ring terminals or underneath. Um, also, we never want to put more than four ring terminals on any given post in a boat. Uh, it's for, for batteries or on a terminal stud anywhere, no more than four. Uh, I like to use a lock nut, just keeps everything from vibrating loose. Now, is it all right to use a uh, wing nut on those? It depends on the battery. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say as a rule of thumb, no. Uh, okay, sm yes, yeah, smaller, low amp hour batteries uh, with small gauge connections to them, you're allowed to use them. But once you get over certain sizes, uh, you cannot use a wing nut. And the reason behind it is you just can't torque them down enough uh, and they're prone to coming loose. So rule of thumb, just use a regular nut. Uh, you'll be much safer in the end. So here we go, we've put this in series now, and you can see when we put our, yep, our voltmeter between the two, we should have 24 volts. 25.9, that's it. 24 volt nominal. So. All right, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, going back to the other option we have is a parallel connection. So a parallel connection is what you're most commonly seeing in a boat. Um, a lot of boats out there are 12 volt systems, so we use a parallel connection to just add more ampacity to the rest of the battery. Uh, to do that, we're gonna hook our, the positive terminals of the battery 
So positive to positive. Uh, if you had a bunch going down here, you just keep chaining them together like that. Uh, once again, we got a washer, lock washer, nut. And we'll do the same thing on the negative side of the battery. So negative terminal to negative terminal. Now this is where a lot of people, I see it um, not done to best practice here. Uh, when you create a battery bank like this, that you have multiple batteries in parallel connection, you always want to take the positive load or you know, the connection on the positive terminal to your house and you want to have the negative feed coming back in at the other end of the chain. Um, and you see here we have you know, 12 volts on this bank. So those two batteries put in a parallel, connect, uh, parallel configuration will give you the 12 volts. Uh, often what we'll see is people bring in the house positive and negative. Uh, often what you'll see is people bring in the house positive and negative to the first battery in the chain. Now you're still going to have 12 volts on here. Uh, the issue is the battery bank doesn't work as effectively as it could. Um, by coming in with the positive on one battery and the negative on the other end of the chain, it forces the whole battery bank to work as a single big battery. Uh, when you put the two here, this battery does most of the work, then the batteries one back just support that battery uh, so they don't work as a giant, you know, one single cohesive bank. All right, so let me get this. So yep. then when you go to hook your stuff up, you're going to put a po your, your positive here, mm -hmm. but you're not going to do the negative here. You're going to do the negative at the end of this one instead. Correct. So that it's kind of like running across here. Exactly. Got it. Okay, that makes sense to me now. Yep. Thank you. How do we run all this in practical terms? I mean, that's what this whole thing is about. Practicality, guys. Um, how do we hook this up? What are the components that we need? All right, so let's start with, um, we're gonna crimp these cables together mm -hmm. first and then wire them up. Yep. Okay. All right, uh, so we already have our test board crimped and ready to go, uh, but I figured I'll show you some test cables here, just how to, how to properly crimp and prepare these. Uh, so the first one we have is a four gauge battery cable or a larger ga gauge cable here. Uh, always wanna use heat shrink that keeps the moisture and everything out of the battery, uh, out of the battery cable, make it last a little bit longer. Uh, slide that on first. I can't tell you how many times I've done this without sliding it on and then you gotta fight it on. Um, we have our tinned copper terminals. Uh, one thing you want to always do is make sure you match the hole size of this to the post that you're putting it on. Uh, you don't want to have an oversized hole going onto a small post. It just has room for play and error. Uh, so always match the hole on the terminal to the post that it's going on. Um, go ahead and you can strip back some cable here. I already did it for you. Uh, so when you're stripping back these jackets, you always want to make sure that you're not cutting into any of the strands of the of the wire. Uh, if you were to cut into and some of the, those strands fall off, you've just reduced the opacity of that wire. Uh, so always make sure when you're stripping back the insulation, you don't cut into the, the, uh, the strands of the conductor there. Uh, also, when you're on a boat, you always want to make sure we're using stranded cable. Um, sometimes you'll see the household Romex on a boat. Uh, the problem with that is it's that solid copper boats flex, boats move. Uh, so over time that copper flex and moves and eventually will fail. Uh, the stranded copper gives you the flexibility you need to not have the wire fail over time from you know, repetitive stress. Uh, also want to use tinned copper. Uh, that'll help with your corrosion resistance so that uh, the wire will last longer. So to crimp this thing, just slide your, can, your um, terminal on. I've got these great crimpers here. Um, I personally like to, when I can, match the brand of the crimper to the brand of the wire to the brand of the terminal because everything, everything sized just perfectly. Uh, sometimes you'll find that if you use a different manufacturer's terminals, the wall th thickness is a little bit di different, so you have to make sure everything's crimped just perfectly, um, takes a little bit of the guesswork out when you kind of match everything together. Uh, on these ones here, I've got these nice number four gauge jaws. So you put it in there, crimp. I like to do a double crimp when I can. So we've got this one here. We will slide this up. 
And I've got my heat gun to set the heat shrink. You're doing heat shrink. Um, these ones are adhesive backed. So when you hit it just right, um, you should see a little bit of adhesive just start to squeeze out from the, the ends of the heat shrink. And that's how you know everything is good and sealed up. Uh, another thing to watch out for with these, um, you wanna make sure that your heat shrink doesn't encroach forward onto the flat part here because uh, what can happen there is when you go to put this on if you have just a little piece of something in between the contact surface and the bus bar that'll decrease the surface area um, and it'll heat up the conductor over time so make sure you keep that flat part nice and clear all right so next we have the branch cable or the smaller gauge cable that we're going to take between the the fuse block we have and our load which in the case is a light bulb um, this is a 16 gauge cable uh, i've got a nice little set of strippers here strip that back and once again you want to make sure that you don't um, cut into any of those internal conductors uh, doubly important on these smaller gauge cables because there's fewer conductors to begin with now bill is that also um I guess you call it marine grade where it's tinned? Correct, yep. And strand? Yep, um, okay. we use Ancor wire here. Uh, all of that is 105 degree Celsius insulation. Uh, it's also marine rated, so it's oil and water resistant jacketing. Um, and it's all tinned stranded copper. Okay. Yep. Um, then we have our nice little terminals. Uh, you're also, you notice that they are, these are tinned copper as well. And they're also all color coded. Um, so red is for 22 to 18 gauge cable. Uh, the blues are 16 and 14 gauge cable. Uh, the yellows are 10 and 12. Beyond that, you're not hand crimping them anymore. You're using this big boy. Um, so that just goes ahead, slides on. Uh, ideally, you want the wire to be just at the tip of this. You have hand crimpers. Uh, I recommend ratcheting crimpers. Uh, the nice thing about there is it won't release until you've got a full crimp on it. Uh, the first crimp or two, two of the day doesn't really matter. The hundredth crimp of the day, you if you don't have ratcheting crimpers, you may not be getting the full squeeze on them. Uh, these are also double crimp, which means we put a strain relief crimp in the uh, around the, the jack of the cable at the same time that we do the crimp for the main um, the main conductor. So that goes in there. And we're done. All right, Bill, I, I got a question here. I see we're using this um, little forky thing. What's it called? Spade terminal. Okay, yeah. spade terminal. This one here is a um, ring terminal with the circle, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does it matter which of these you use in your breaker box? No, not at all. Um, they're both ABYC compliant. Okay. I can tell you I personally prefer the spade terminal when we're talking about fuse blocks and those things because you don't have to take the screw all the way out to put it right, on. Right, right. That's uh, what I've come across. Yep. Okay. Uh, one, one thing you do want to see with these spade terminals, um, for ABYC compliance, you want to use what's called a captive spade. So it has this little forks at the end of it. Uh, that keeps it from just sliding out if the screw gets a little bit loose. Okay, uh, all right, yep. all right. So, you know, here again, guys, we're talking marine, bouncing around. I mean, you know, how many times are you out there and, you know, it's, it's not uh, a walk in the park all the time. Anytime you have a loose connection or a connection that's not perfectly solid, you have less surface area making that connection. So it's the same thing as if you were trying to push more amperage through a smaller gauge wire at that point in time. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and put together uh, kind of a little uh, sample system here. Uh, so we've got our battery, positive negative terminals. Um, it goes to a um, battery switch here. We have our main overcurrent protection, which we'll talk about a little bit, into our breaker panel, in which case is the fuse panel. Uh, goes out to a switch, the load, and then completes the circuit back to the battery. Uh, so we'll go ahead and hook this up real quick. Since we're actually turning it on, we'll tighten it down. All right, uh, so we were talking a little bit earlier about um, battery monitors. 
Um, this would be a great time to show you where we would hook one in. Yep, so if we were to put a battery monitor up under here, we'd want to put it in this cable between where the battery charger hooks in at the battery switch and the battery, because we don't want to have any loads coming off or coming in uh, before that battery monitor. Uh, there's a couple of di different styles out there. Um, I personally like the ones that network in so you can share it over the Dyneema 2 2000 network to the rest of your equipment, get that data anywhere on the boat. Um, they come in either a shunt style, in which case you'd break this wire apart. You have one on one side, one on the other, and that measures the amperage going through that, or a ring style, which just clamps around the cable and uses the Hall effect to, to measure the amperage going in and out of the battery. A couple options there is a lot of, that's a, really a topic for another day. We could go on forever about electronics. All right. So we have the main overcurrent protection here. Um, go into our, our distribution block, which uh, could be your, your circuit breaker panel of the boat, uh, switches with fuses, any, any number of things. Uh, the big thing that this serves is to step our circuit protection down. So this is a 100 amp uh, circuit breaker, which is fine for this big heavy gauge cable, uh, far too large for this 16 gauge cable. So as we step down here, we need to make sure we've re-circuit protected it to protect that smaller gauge cable in the line. Uh, cable runs into your switch to the load and then completes the circuit back to the battery. And that's right. about it. All right, so what else do you want to talk about? Oh, I tell you what, it's making my head spin, guys. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here, and I think you made it look I'm not going to say simple, but you explained it well to where it's going to make more sense to people. And I'm looking forward to our next couple videos where we're talking about the inverters and the um, uh, solar and wind power type of thing. Thanks. I mean, I appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. And guys, stay tuned because we're going to have a lot more of this. And Bill did a great job, I think. Give him a thumbs up, will you please? Thanks. Alrighty.